if you could go ahead and start recording. Thank you. So um, uh, thank you all for your patience. I, I guess you are the uh, happy uh, 100 participants uh, in this thing. Uh, we didn't realize, we thought we'd expanded our service, but we didn't realize that we were limited to that. Uh, we are recording it, so uh, if you're uncomfortable with that, please please tell us or or just exit. That's fine. Um, welcome to the San Juan Island Virtual Library. Um, we uh, are delighted to do this. My name is Boyd Pratt. I'm the Adult Programs Associate, uh, which means I have the privilege and honor of uh, hosting this with uh, Ranger Jeff in terms of geology. I'm going to go over a few. Um, Zoom things that you might be interested in. Um, I recommend that you uh, hover on the bottom of your screen and you'll see participants where the 100 participants are showing. I, if you click on that, you will actually see the participants on the right hand side. And um, when we, and it will also, depending on your screen view options, you will be seeing the various participants on your screen in addition to the screen that, that Ranger Jeff is sharing with us. If you just like to see him and the presentation, then just click on um, speaker view and, and you'll just see him as a little thumbnail and his presentation itself. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is that um, that we, I guess we don't have a chat box, so we are gonna have a question and answer after the program itself. Um, I expect Jeff to be presenting for about an hour, and then we will be doing a Q and A for about a half an hour. If you'd like to ask a question, please virtually raise your hand, and you can do that by hovering over your name in the participants, and it'll give you the options on the right hand side of, of raising your hand virtually. And I'll try to recognize that and unmute you and then uh, you'll be able to ask your question. Uh, as I said, this is being recorded. Uh, give us a few days, but it will eventually end up on the library website under events, recordings, and uh, then you can see that. So when uh, Ranger Jeff and I started meeting about this, it was actually uh, before the beginning of the year. It was pre-COVID times. We thought we would actually have these presentations physically at the library. Um, and of course that didn't happen. Um, what it did allow for is if we had had uh, 200 signups for, or 200 people coming to a program uh, at the library itself, it would have been horrible. So uh, I, we're able to do this virtually and I'm, I'm really um, appreciative of doing that. Um, Ranger Jeff is uh, widely versed in a lot of things about the park. Uh, last month he gave, this is a five part series and a possibly a six part series if we'll continue on with the geology uh, aspect. And last week he gave one, uh, sorry, last month he gave one on foxes and rabbits. And next month, uh, again, the second Wednesday of the month in July, uh, we'll be doing one on salmon bank. And so it should be uh, really interesting. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna actually uh, turn it over to Ranger Jeff. Thank you so much for doing this, Jeff, and uh, take it away. Awesome, awesome. Thanks, Boyd. Thanks also, Floyd. If you guys don't mind, just because it's really, really peculiar watching yourself on screen while you're trying to present, I'm going to shut off my video, but there you, you see me. Um, I'm sitting here on, um, on the prairie at American Camp. Um, not really, but you get the idea. <clears throat> So um, thanks to the library and also to the park for co-sponsoring these. I am an interpretive ranger at the park. And if you don't know what an interpretive ranger is, is I take a topic, study it in depth, and then offer it back to the public in ways that are hopefully entertaining, but also in ways that create connections for the public to the park. In this case, I'm taking a very complex topic, geology, and trying to make sense of it in terms that I can understand. And what that means for you is that I've boiled it down in terms that I think you can understand. 
as Boyd said, <laughs> this is a five-part series, perhaps six. Um, I offered, uh, as I get into this, it occurred to me that some of you um, folks that are interested in geology might be interested in actual geologic features on and around the island. So uh, we're gonna discuss that and see if we can boil it down into uh, a sixth uh, element in the series, perhaps uh, in September sometime. So keep an eye out for that. So <clears throat> with that, let's take uh, a look at the evolution of geology in the San Juan Islands. This is a photograph of where an understanding of geology of the San Juan should probably begin. It's Scotland, oddly enough. In 1788, a Scottish naturalist by the name of James Hutton saw this scene. He had been looking for it for quite a while and found it at a place called Sicker Point uh, on the North Sea coast in southern Scotland. Um, and he knew what he had discovered as soon as he, as he saw it. Uh, looking at this photograph, he concluded that the Earth had to be far older and far more complex a system than he had originally thought. Uh, folks in the day believed that the Earth was about 6,000 years old, if you can believe that. Um, Hutton called this, uh, this photograph, this <coughs> set of rocks, uh, an unconformity, meaning that this structure made no sense in, um, in, in geologic terms of that time uh, and in terms of what they knew about geology at the time. So he set out to explain it. And in the process, he laid the foundations for modern geology and an understanding of the rock cycle and ultimately the theory of plate tectonics. Um, what you see here is a vertical column in the bottom right, surrounded by yellow. That is sandstone, covered by two distinctly different layers of different sandstone. So Hutton looked at this and he concluded that it of course made no sense. And so he set off to explain how this had happened. And we're the benefactors of this theory of what he called uniformitarian geology, hard to say, but meaning that the laws and processes that operate in the universe have never changed and they apply everywhere. Geology is the perfect example proving Hutton's theory. So let's take a look. What Hutton concluded is, as I said, that the Earth must be, must be much older than, than what was previously thought. And future generations, of course, would prove him right. But just how old is the Earth? And how do we understand it? So 4.6 billion years is, is a long time, right? <laughs> and trying to, to understand that, we really need some kind of a metaphor or a, or a paradigm in which to talk about 4.6 billion years of Earth's history. So what I've done is taken 4.6 billion years and I've boiled it down to a 365 year long calendar. And if I do that, here's how geologic time shapes out, just to kind of give you a perspective of just how big a time spans we're talking about. On February 25th of that year, prokaryotes came into being. Prokaryotes are uh, the original life form on the planet, or one of them, and it was the first single-celled uh, organism on the planet. No nucleus, no, um, no, um, uh, no other major structures inside of that cell. On March 5th, the rock on the planet Earth hardens. On August 15th, the first cell with a nucleus shows up. Dinosaurs show up on December the 13th. Flowering plants showed up on December 22nd. Primates, our descendants uh, or, or <clears throat> our ancestors, showed up on the 28th of December. Modern humans showed up on December 31st at 11.48 p.m. And you and I, we showed up at 0 0.005 seconds before midnight. So I always ask this question when I do this in a walk, how important do you feel now? Um, it kind of humbles me to think that <clears throat> uh, my entire lifespan is going to be less than one one hundredth or one one thousandth of a second. 
So we need to get some terminology out of the way as well. Some, some basic things that as I talk, you, <clears throat> you are at least acquainted with them. Plate tectonics uh, or continental drift is the movement of big pieces of the earth uh, uh, across, uh, of the earth's crust across the surface of the earth. Terrains are a fragment of that crust that's broken off from one tectonic plate and ultimately finds its way onto another plate. Accretion is a process by which uh, materials such as terrains uh, are added to another tectonic plate, usually a, um, a tectonic plate that's above water. Subduction is the real, the real big term that we need to get our heads around, and it's when one plate, usually undersea or oceanic, slides under another plate, usually above the water. Um, not always, but usually. And that subduction zone is just the area that describes where those two plates meet. Faults uh, is a planar fracture or a discontinuity, basically a break in the earth where there's been significant displacement or movement uh, as a result of that break and then movement of um, uh, along that break. Magma, of course, molten rock that uh, hasn't surfaced. Lava is the same rock that has surfaced and a pluton or an underground molten rock bubble. And if I have multiple plutons, I have something called a batholith. And all these are, are big molten bubbles of molten rock that reside deep uh, under the surface of the earth and are responsible for both mountain building as well as um, the formation of a kind of kinds of rock we'll talk about later, um, but also uh, are found particularly throughout the West Coast uh, in the form of granite. And you'll find these in the Cascades and the Sierras, but we'll talk more about that in a moment. So to understand how the islands were formed, we have to understand something about that continental, continental drift or, or tectonics. Here we see from the top left to the bottom right, a progression of the movement of the major components uh, that made up um, Earth's surface beginning at 320 million years ago. The two major components were Laurasia and Gondwana. Uh, you might know this as combined as uh, Pangaea, uh, which evolved a, a bit later at 250 million years, and then progressing to today. What we're going to look at is some of these major components and where the islands were at during each of these major components and then how they were moving and some of the other things that were going on while this, uh, this movement was occurring. It's, it's pretty fascinating stuff, or at least I, I think so. I hope you find it so. How does this happen is the big question, right? So continental drift occurs because of this thing called subduction, one plate sliding underneath uh, another. Those plates are moving because uh, uh, a, the earth splits somewhere offshore. Here we can see the split that caused everything that's happening here, well, it, it, something like this anyway. This is called the Juan de Fuca Ridge. You know, in times past, there was another ridge called the Mid-Pacific uh, Mid <coughs> Mid Pacific Ridge that um, pushed the Farallon Plate. But essentially what we're talking about is a crack opens up underneath the ocean and it begins pushing molten rock towards the surface. As that rock rises and pushes towards the crack, it of course <coughs> can't all get through the crack, but it cools as it gets closer to the surface and closer to the water. As it cools, it creates a convection current. That molten rock then moves on both sides of the crack, and that in essence is pulling and pushing um, the earth on either side of that crack apart. As it pushes that apart, it's pushing, obviously, everything on one side towards the North American continent. And that's how the uh, earth, uh, the, the material under the seafloor is being pushed towards us or towards the more North American plate. So here we see, again, the Juan de Fuca Ridge as an example. Here we see the coastal range, including the Olympics. We see the Puget Sound where we're at the Willamette Valley, we of course see the Cascades on the other side, and Western Washington. To describe what, what I was talking about, this is that mid-ocean ridge where hot magma is trying to flow up and trying to get out, but because it can't, it's cooling, and then on either side of this crack is flowing back down. 
and cooling, creating a convection current, and this never stops. As it is moving, it is pushing this material to, towards the North American continent. As it arrives, because it's heavier, it's underwater and the rocks are heavier, it is subducting, it's rolling underneath the North American continent. As it rolls underneath, getting deeper and deeper and deeper, and at about 20 miles down, that plate begins to melt. Not only because of friction, but a really, really um, unique um, chemical reaction. This is relatively new science, so um, it, it, it is not absolutely certain this is in fact happening, but they're, they're pretty sure. They have some, a lot of evidence from multiple places across the planet. But essentially what happens is that, that not only is friction causing that rock to melt, it's also, the plate is also dragging seawater down. And at mid-ocean ridges, as they subduct, they're carrying a rock called olivine. Olivine, under pressure, <clears throat> uh, decomposes or changes into what's something called serpentine. Serpentine has a, um, a very uh, exothermic reaction under pressure. So when that serpentine at 20 miles down under heat and pressure, begins to have an exothermic reaction, it superheats the seawater that is taken with it, combining with the friction created by the plate subduction, and it superheats the rock around it and melts it uh, along with that steam. What happens to melted rock in the presence of hard rock, solid rock, or more plastic rock, is that it wants to rise. It's full of gases, it's much lighter, and it looks for places to rise. In this case, it has a natural place to rise, that crack between the two plates. That crack also represents, by the way, the Cascades and further south, the Sierra Nevada. This is what creates uh, a lot of the, or all of the volcanic activity, not only in the Cascades, but in the Sierra Nevada as well. So if I look at this, what's called the Cascadia subduction zone, I'm sure you've heard about it, uh, represented by the Cascades. That runs from roughly 100 miles off the coast of our islands here to just the other side of the Cascades, the North Cascades. And it runs from the northern end of Vancouver Island all the way south to central California and Mendocino. If you've been to Mendocino, uh, you know it's a beautiful, beautiful area, but it's also very, very um, active seismically. Um, because of primarily uh, of the fault zones in that region, but also affected by this subduction of the Juan de Fuca plate and the plates that are further south. So that's how subduction works. That's what's driving, I spent a bit of time on that because that's really what's driving everything that's going on here. So while the spreading, the subduction does drive some of that Pacific plate or some of the, the marine plate to subduct or drive underneath the continental plate, some of that material is not heavy enough to subduct. These are typically um, light sediments or volcanic arcs, volcanic islands. So when they're riding, uh, riding on top of the rest of the plate and they arrive <coughs> at the um, subduction boundary, they're simply not heavy enough to drive underneath that plate. So they use something called a crete. I use the example when I do the walk of if you took um, a stick of warm butter and rolled a butter knife across the top of it, some of it would roll back in kind of a, kind of a, a wave. And that's essentially what's happening here. It's being, this material is being scraped off uh, as the material underneath it is being subducted. And it, it as it, Crete, it forms an accretion wedge, and that material then lifts and forms mountains, or it simply sutures itself on to the, the new continent that it is, um, is being driven against. All this skimming off of material is what has formed not only these islands, but believe it or not, and we'll see this in a picture in a bit, everything from the coast inland to about 400 miles. And if we look at some of the, the images that I have even later, you will see that the entire west coast of North America, 
far past the Rocky Mountains is accreted landmass from far, far back in Earth's history. So it's quicker than I thought. This is the diagram that I was talking about. If you look at the age of the rock in this diagram, you see how young the rocks around the border of North America are, right? Less than 0.6 billion years old, so 500 million years old. And increasingly, as we go towards the center, they get older and older until we get to the Hudson Bay area, the oldest rock in North America, greater than 2.5 billion years old. Here on the right, we see where the San Juan Islands are, and we see all these accretion belts, all these insular belts that have arrived via subduction and accretion and stacked up against the North American plate. This is the direction of movement. And over time, sutured themselves on becoming part of North America. Over time, as North America continues to move in the opposite direction, these belts will, after they have sutured, move on with the rest of the North American plate over time. And we'll see an example of that a bit later. I find this absolutely fascinating. So let me explain what we're looking at here. What we're looking at here is the North Pole and the relative position of the center of North America, somewhere in Kansas, I suppose, over time. Here's where Kansas was 230 million years ago. Here's where it was 200 million years ago, 180, 155, 140, and today. And you see, we've been relatively static for about the last 70 million years. What does that represent in terms of actual miles? <clears throat> about 12,600 miles at the pace of inches per year. I find that absolutely astonishing. Again, it's hard to wrap our heads around these vast spans of geologic time. So our story starts in earnest 200 million years ago. Where you see MYA, that means million years ago. MY means million years. So what else is happening at this time? If we look at this in uh, geologic uh, eon era period and epic times, we're talking about from the middle Jurassic period until today, all right? Just to give you a time frame. About 200 million years until today. At 200 million years ago, the late Triassic, this is what Earth, uh, or excuse me, North America looked like, at least in our sector. Here you see the United States and Canada. Here you see Africa and South America and where they would eventually break here. We see here in red where the 30th parallel was, running through somewhere just north of Nebraska, Lincoln, Nebraska, I think, and today at about Houston, Texas. That's a movement of about 1,600 miles in the last 200 million years. Around that time, something else happened. So this piece, which was originally sutured on, <clears throat> began to move west again. So a huge ocean opened here called the Slide Mountain Ocean. Uh, by the early Jurassic, something else happened. This is called the Navajo Erg, or Sand Sea. That makes sense if you visit some of the national parks in the desert southwest, where you see uh, things like Arches National Park or um, uh, the Grand Canyon, and you see that material, um, those great sand seas that have been ro eroded away over millions of years. Also, here we see those Columbia Mountains that we talked about. And you can see just how far, how much material has been added to the west coast of North America. And again, the North American plate continues to move south, southwest at this point, and everything in the Pacific moving north, northeast. And again, where the Columbia Mountains are, if you drive across the border northeast into Canada. At 170 million years ago, Middle Jurassic, we see North America and Eurasia, Laurentia, separating, now separating from the rest of Gondwana. Or, uh, Gondwana. We see the, um, um, the Caribbean opening up and the, west, uh, the east coast of North America. We see 
uh, beginning to open in the, um, we see the, the entire plate beginning to rotate towards the west, and we see um, gas seas opening up between the two. At 150 million years ago, we welcomed uh, a neighbor, Vancouver Island. Here we see at 180 million years ago uh, where Alexandria and Rangela terrains uh, were relative to North America. Here we see how they've moved over that uh, one, uh, excuse me, 90 million year period to attach themselves to North America. Rangelia, by the way, is named after the Wrangell Mountains in Alaska, and those are also named after a, a famous um, Russian explorer from the 19th century. But if you want to see the southern tip of Rangelia today, just drive over to Limekiln Lighthouse and look across, and you will see Victoria, British Columbia. That is the southernmost expression of Rangelia. Where did it come from? The middle of the South Pacific, at about the same latitude is Baja California. Pretty amazing. At the same time, plutonic formations ran from Arizona through California and into Canada. Uh, these plutons cooled over a period of about 100 million years, creating the granite that marks the shear, shear walls in, in Yosemite, where I used to work. And if you've been to Yosemite, you know how powerful uh, a granite wall can be. And think of that wall taking 100 million years to be cool, to cool and then to be revealed by erosion. At 150 to 130 million years ago, subduction of the Farallon plate um, was pretty much over and it dragged Rangelia to a position off the coast of southern, southern British Columbia. The, the JDF or the Juan de Fuca plate had been subducting at about 1.4 inches per year. Faults between Rangelia and the still forming cascades uh, were resulting in magma being squeezed between the, the two approaching bodies. Uh, and they, those created plutons as well that would later become the cascades, as well as the coastal mountains of British Columbia, Yukon, uh, and further into Alaska, all the way up to the, the North Pole. Along the subduction zone, volcanoes were erupting and pouring lava on top of the evolving landscape and the geology that had all been laid down. So you're starting to see this accumulation of all kinds of material arriving from in the middle of the Pacific, where it was not, um, the rock was nothing like the rock at North America. We see volcanoes pouring lava on top of that newly arriving material, uh, making it even more complex. And we see the compacting of this material, which um, decomposes it or metamorphosizes the rock. It twists it and turns it and buries it, making the geology here some of the most complex geology on the planet. At this point, the San Juans are still further south uh, about Baja and far out into the Pacific. At 94 million years ago, a vast interior seaway opens, connecting the Arctic Ocean to the <coughs> excuse me, Gulf of Mexico. Um, this area today, as we, as we talked about, is, uh, is rich in sedimentary deposits, um, ocean floor deposits. Uh, these deposits now are highly eroded. And again, you can find those in beautiful expression all over the desert southwest. Uh, our islands uh, still hadn't arrived, but good news, they're probably above water at that point and moving east just off the southern, excuse me, the western tip uh, of Vancouver Island. Also about 94 million years ago, Rangelia had completed this journey. I really, really like this diagram and I threw it in for one particular reason. We can see the angular movement of Rangelia and pretty much what everything else, the, the same path that everything else took arriving on the west coast and the movement of North America, 225, 190, 90, and 50 million years ago. Um, and here, what I was talking about earlier, once a terrain sutures itself onto another body and becomes part of it, it begins to move with that body. So we, now we see the relative movement of Rangelia once it had attached along with the rest of North America, now moving south, southwest. Um, 
I, I had to look it up. Oops, sorry. Let's go back. I had to look it up because I, I saw this term and I had no idea what it meant. Ventral is uh, Latin for left and dextral is Latin for right or anybody that cares. At 55 million years ago, most of the Pacific Northwest was in place uh, except for the Olympic Mountains. Uh, our continental margin was now west of the Cascades. Uh, the granite of the Sierra Nevada uh, had been formed but had not yet begun to rise. The Sierra Nevada was, was rolling hills um, and with, with small rivers running through them, but the granite of the Sierra Nevadas was still offshore um, in California, and you can see it expressed there. The spreading center at the western boundary of the Juan de Fuca was still producing huge amounts of magma that today form the basis of the Olympics as well as the North Cascades. By 50 million years ago, the Olympics were still west of their current position and underwater. Here we can see a time slice from about 190 million years ago when the Olympics and the San Juans were still off the coast of southern Mexico. In this image, we get a look at three slices, three vignettes of how the Cascades were actually formed. So over millions of years, we see sediment being laid down on the seafloor. At about 50, 30 to 50 million years ago, volcanic activity started underneath the seafloor and was venting into that sediment, depositing huge amounts of basalt. The basalt in this area is some of the thickest in the world, roughly 10 miles thick. And remember what's occurring as well. All this material, even if that's happening, is being pushed towards the North American continent. Here we see the continental margin. At 12 to 30 million years ago, that material is getting pushed from behind and is stacking up against the basalt, which is now turning on its side and cramping the rock in between the continental margin and the basalt and overriding the continental margin that was already there. Remember we talked earlier that most, um, most of the time when a um, undersea plate arrives at a above sea plate that it will subduct. Here, the material was so light that it could not subduct. So what it did was it rode over and began to stack up. That's why we see those huge jagged peaks in the Olympic. That is very, very new rock and is representative of a rising mountain formation which continues to rise. And we'll, um, we, I think we get a look uh, in a later picture at uh, how those terrains actually stacked up to form the Olympics. And present day, we see Hurricane Ridge here, and we see all that material that rolls down to the coast, and then the continental margin somewhere down around Tacoma. Pretty amazing stuff. At 35 million years ago, volcanics in the Cascades begin in earnest. Here we see that Cascade volcanic arc. Each of these represents a volcano uh, active sometime in the last 100 million years. Here we see the Juan de Fuca plate that's driving most of that activity. I wanna point something else pretty interesting out. From the coast to this mountain ridge is between 40 and 60 miles. Remember what happens when that Pacific plate is diving underneath the North American plate. When it gets to a depth, at about 20 miles deep, it's here. That's when the melting begins to occur. We're gonna see another picture in just a moment that will really express this well. But when it dives underneath, that friction and the conversion of olivine to serpentine and magnetite, um, creating steam out of the seawater that's drug under is super melting that rock. And that crack is already there waiting to receive that melted lava that's coming from beneath. Here we see all those volcanoes over the last 45 million years. This makes sense, right? As the, these are the younger ones. These are the older volcanoes. As the Pacific plate is moving further to the east, we should see, continue to see, the Cascades continue to evolve in this direction 
and create new volcanoes along this arc, which will continue to move east. These are about four to seven million years old. The blue ones as old as 35 million years old. At 35 million years ago, uh, the Cascades had begun to rise. Uh, here we see the Southern Cascade, oh, excuse me. Here we see the Southern, Cap. Eh, my slippery finger here. Here we see the Southern Cascades, North Cascades, Puget Lowland and the Coastal Range. And if we looked across the border, we would see the uh, Columbia Mountains as well. The Cascades, like uh, everything else in the Pacific Northwest, are a collage of terrains. At this point, uh, their terrains were thrust upward and faulted laterally into what's really nothing more than a jumbled array of mountains, uh, turned on their sides and then further pushed from behind. Over time, these predecessors to today's North Cascades were further faulted and eroded into a level plain. So imagine these mountains eroding over millions of years into a level plain. During the past 40 million years, heavier rock was pushed up underneath the same region. And at the same time, in, intense heat was created at great depths, uh, causing that rock to melt. Some of the melt rose to the surface as volcanoes, like Mount Baker, and the rest crystallized at various depths to form large bodies of granite, which represent the Cascades today. A, a little bit of foreshadowing about that granite. The islands are gonna see that granite in about 34 million years. So the modern Cascades have pushed upward, exposing the roots of that ancient collision zone. And um, it's, it's a well-known geologic fact that the North Cascades represents some of the most complex and least understood geology in North America. So let's leap ahead about 2.6 million years to the last ice age. Here we see the ice age in full roar. So we see the Cordelian ice sheet, it's moving north to south, right into the Puget Sound and rolling over home. By the way, there have been five significant ice ages through Earth's history and a dozen or so major glaciers over the, the last um, one million years. So the most recent glacial period, often known as, somebody was really created with the name here, the Ice Age, uh, reached its peak conditions about 18,000 years ago before giving way to an interglacial period about 11,700 years ago. And anybody that knows a little bit about history knows that what happened at 11,700 years ago, the Bering Land Bridge um, <clears throat> uh, began to close as that Cordelian ice sheet began to melt. This is when uh, lots of species were stranded in North America and Native Americans that had crossed the Bering Land Bridge and migrated had uh, found their way into the islands and were making a home here. The last major glaciation period um, began when this, this one that we're talking about, when Earth entered something called a Milankovitch cycle. Now, this is not true geology, but I'm, I'm going to talk about it briefly in the next slide, just because I think it's, it's I always get asked the question, how do, how do ice ages, how do glaciers form? Uh, I studied them quite a bit in Yosemite, and um, the ones here are absolutely no different. During that peak period, ice at Seattle was 3,000 feet deep, and here uh, on the islands, as much as 6,000 feet deep. Because all that water was locked up in ice, the Puget Sound was about three to 400 feet lower than it was today, is, than it is today. Uh, during that time, as the glaciers moved, uh, it acts like sandpaper on the ground beneath it, uh, tilling everything up, taking that gravel and rolling over hard rock and exposing it and leaving its track. I carved out um, huge quantities of rock from the Cascades, brought it downhill into the lowlands and into the islands. And that's why we see those, those um, granite erratics all over the island. And there are many, many more covered by the topsoil and by the sand. Um, as glaciers melt and recede, the water is released and eroded on the land and is carried away uh, downstream uh, in the form of sediment and out to sea. That, that 
becomes sand and is probably found in every ocean on earth at this point. And we find that sediment all over the islands, particularly down at American Camp. That sediment is really why we have the prairies on the south end of the island, because that sediment, that glacial till is so deep that it won't hold water. Uh, it does well with grasses, but it won't um, hold enough water to um, sustain trees and, and lots of other um, uh, plant life that requires a lot of water. So why do ice ages occur? Something called that Milankovic cycle. I'll just go over it briefly. It's three pieces, but they all add up to the same thing. Um, eccentricity, deviation from the elliptical orbit, orbit, how far out of a true ellipse we move as we circle the sun. Axial tilt, how far, um, oops. Um, the, the normal axis, the earth is rotating, how much it is tilted, and then precession, the movement of that axis um, around another axis due to torque. In this case, the torque is gravity acting on the planet. So the, the end result is the surface of the earth spends less time facing the sun. It spends less time facing the sun, the surface is colder. Precipitation that would have fallen as rain is now falling as snow. The snow accumulates. It creates huge ice sheets called glaciers. And at about 205 feet deep, those glaciers begin to move under their own weight. And like everything else on the planet, uh, everything else in the universe, it's ruled by gravity. So it's pulled downhill, in this case, downhill from Canada into the Puget Sound. So, what geology have these conditions left us? As we said, glacial till and sediment that define much of the region, particularly the islands, glacial erratics of all sizes, a variety of old rock types, highly integrated, mixed up. Uh, I think that probably defines the islands geologically better than anything else. It's just a really mixed up place. Many converging fault lines and zones, uh, a relatively unstable ge geologic region, and the rain shadow effect. Let's take a look at each of those just for a moment. Glaciation created the dry prairies, uh, fertile valleys, and the salmon banks. Uh, they brought all of our overlying material that covered the base geology and left very thin topsoil on most of the island. They smoothed the underlying rock and created broad U-shaped valleys. They also left us with these glacial striations as it's the glaciers, the high pressure from the glaciers is pushing gravel and rock across the bedrock, it leaves these striations. You can always tell the direction of the movement of the glaciers, in this case, always north to south. It also leaves us with these very interesting features. So most people will not notice these three terrains on the side of Mount Finlayson. <clears throat> Those are created by a combination of two things. Number one, as the ice pressure is relieved on a land mass, um, it creates something called isostatic rebound. So the islands are actually, if you imagine a foam mattress and putting your hand on it and then lifting it up, you can see that mattress rise. Well, the same thing is happening here. As the glacial pressure is, is unloaded off of the land, it begins to rise. Something else is happening at the same time. That melted glacier is uh, flowing back into, in this case, the Puget Sound. So we have constant up and down movement between the land and the seawater and the tides coming in and going out. What we have here is actually three distinct, one, two, three shorelines. These are old shorelines. Here is the fourth. At some point in time, there will be a fifth and a sixth, assuming the island is still here. The salmon banks, also a product of glaciation. Here we see Mount Finlayson. Here we see the salmon banks. Look at the difference in the water depth. Why are the salmon banks called the salmon banks? Because they're the most prolific salmon fishing grounds in the Puget Sound. Fish salmon um, like to swim at between 60 and 120 feet deep. Well, guess what, how deep this is? Between 60 and 120 feet deep. 
They moved down the west coast of the island, right down to the salmon banks. As the, the flow of the land rises, the fish rise with it, and they're pushed in this direction here. This is the, the, the salmon run. As the orcas follow them, they will tend to herd those salmon up against the shore and two of them or three of them will get out here and push the salmon up to shore and the rest of them will be back in this area feeding. If you see fishing boats off salmon banks, they're always fishing this line or this line. And by the way, another reason for the salmon banks is 300 to 450 feet deep water in that channel, which is causing tidal surge here. <clears throat> we have tidal flow here and the wind and water pushing the sand this way. That's the reason for the salmon banks. Thank you, geology. Tectonic activity has left its mark as well. These are the primary sand types on the island. These are the parent rocks, shale, sandstone, limestone, and basalt. And this is what they devolve into or metamorphosize into, gneiss, quartzite, marble, and egalite. Um, the yellow era indicates the progression of metamorphosism or the change in rock structure until it's again melted at subduction. The, the San Juans uh, are primarily metamorphic and sedimentary rock. Believe it or not, no natural granite on the islands. This has all been carried here from the Cascades. It's all folded, highly metamorphosized, owing to changes from heat, pressure, and time. Quickly, here is a south-north geologic cut. If I take the islands and slice them in half, looking south to north, here I see, this is the San Juans. These are the various terrains that have piled up to form the San Juan Islands. And you can see their, relatively age, their relative age, 430 million for the Harrow thrust, 225 million years for this Triassic thrust, and 170 to 200 for this um, thrust at the base. We can also see the tops of those thrusts the Dead Man Bay Volcanics. If you wanna see some of the only volcanics on the island, go to Dead Man Bay, walk to the beach, turn left, go to the very end, and you will see some of the only basalt or true volcanic structures on the island. There are a few others here and there, but that's the best place to see them. You'll see um, Mount Dallas, Young Hill, and Mount Mitchell as well. These are all folded by getting pushed from behind, thrust faulted behind into something called a syncline. You can see that here, right? Where it's all twisting up. This is called a syncline. So as it's thrust faulted, piled up against one another and it begins to stretch upward, this is called a syncline. Looking at the same cut from Northwest to Southeast, we see the Haro thrust, Orca's thrust, Rosario thrust, Lopez thrust, and the Lummi formation uh, over on uh, Orca's Island. These are all, again, terrains piled up southeast to northwest, forming um, the island, the complex island geologic structure we've been talking about. So these are, if you're out looking, uh, I wanted to point out some of the primary rock types. This is probably the most famous on the island. This is called Orca's Chert. Um, the next one is mudstone, obviously, um, made out of mud. We see basalt, which is volcanic in nature. We see gray whack, also known as volcanic sandstone. This rock is unusual in that its, um, its origins are at those thermal vents we discussed, or those mid-ocean ridges. As the sand is pushed from beneath and rolled towards the continent, it uh, compacts and over time changes its chemical structure to become sandstone. And then finally, we see schist. Uh, on Young Hill, about two thirds of the way up on the right hand side, there are some nice outcrops that break away continuously. Pick one up and it will absolutely fall away, fall away in your hand. It's very, very highly, what is called, um, it's, it's schistosity. It's very highly fractured. Uh, there's all, almost nothing left of it. What does that mean? It's going to erode very, very quickly. The Olympic rain shadow effect, I think everybody understands this, but just for clarity, because the mountains rise in between um, us and the prevailing wind, 
as the wind moves up the Olympic Mountains, it wants to drop its moisture. And it does so, most of it in the whole rainforest, the largest rainforest in North America. Once it gets over the mountains, it has dropped all of its uh, moisture, flows down the eastern side of the Olympics out into the Puget Sound as dry air. And that's why we have that beautiful rain shadow effect that gives us so much more sunshine than the, the rest of the region. If you're interested to know where one of the most famous rain shadows in the world is at, you might recognize this place. Uh, this is Death Valley. The rain shadow effect comes from the Sierra Nevada, one of the driest and hottest places on the planet. So, what does the future hold? Relative instability in North America will continue. Where is most of that instability? Right here at home, California and the Puget Sound. Some here in um, Eastern Idaho and uh, Nevada as well, and here in the Midwest, oddly enough. Um, the Puget Sound has a 75% or greater chance of being struck uh, by a damaging earth earthquake in the next 100 years. Why is the West Coast so unstable? It's the leading edge of a collision. It's the front bumper on your car uh, if you have a head-on collision. Uh, just at the front of the car sustains most of the damage in a head-on collision. The Western US is in the front of the car. And there's, by the way, no insurance policy for uh, to cover damage that big. Here we see a real close up of this instability. Now I want you to think about this as we look at it. We have the San Andreas Fault pushing California north, slip faulting along itself. We have a rotating block of granite mostly, rotating to the north, northwest. We have the Juan de Fuca plate pushing from the west and we have really hard rock here where we're at, keeping all of that from pushing further north. It's holding everything to the south back. And then we have this volcanic arc that we call the Cascade Volcanic Arc. What does that mean? That means, oops, that means a heck of a lot of pressure building up in this area. As pressure builds up, ultimately it's gonna to have to be released. The release of that pressure is movement of the land mass. As land moves along a fault zone, it creates seismic activity and volcanoes. And we're gonna see where those fault lines in our region are actually at. The squeezing and rotating of structures underlying most of the west coast of the Washington um, and that rotation is just putting stress on the underlying geology that has to be released at some point in time. Here we see those major fault zones in the region. Cascadia subduction zone, all the fault lines off the coast. The ones we should really be concerned about are right here. This is called the Seattle Fault. Here's where we're at. Just to the south of us, there's the Whidbey Island Fault as well, which is also very dangerous. And these are primarily uh, um, shallow thrust or shallow fault zones. What that means is they have a higher propensity for creating damage during earthquakes. You can see high damage earthquakes here, somewhere in medium in here, really high in this region. Seattle, uh, when this comes to pass, is gonna get hit pretty hard. So the question always becomes, well, how big a deal is this? This is from a planning scenario of potential seismic damage in the region produced um, by the US Geological Service in 2009. I checked it and it's still up to date. You see this black um, um, area here. This is that Seattle fault zone. You see the red, which is extreme perceived shaking, very high damage, and where most of that activity is going to occur. Right along that line where we saw the primary stress coming from north and south. Here in the islands, the risk is still very strong but uh, probably not severe. Our major problem here is going to be associated with uh, the aftermath, which will be the tsunamis. Dangers of a quake in our region, I'm not qualified to um, 
convey the effects of any type of seismic activity um, that might be generated by the, the geology. So here you can see how scientists and emergency managers articulate the greatest threat to the region. It's a subduction zone earthquake or a Seattle fault earthquake. They pretty much lay it out here. A subduction zone earthquake would generate the most widespread damage of any scenario. In the <clears throat> presentation, when it gets posted, um, you will see the links. Um, this comes from the Washington State Magazine, which takes this information from the Seattle Office of Emergency Management, Hazard Identification and Vulnerability Analysis. You can find that on the City of Seattle website, or I can send you a copy if you like. 250 million years from now, what's going on? The old adage that the only constant is change certainly applies to geology. Though we see a landscape through a very, very small time lens, change occurs here and occurs everywhere and it simply never stops. I hope, hope you'll take this information and consider it while you hike or you boat around the islands. I also hope that you'll um, give you an added appreciation for the beautiful, complex, and ever-changing place of this place that we call home. What's it going to look like in 250 million years? Plates are going to continue to move, subduct, and accrete. Volcanoes are going to continue to develop, activate, and go dormant. Sea level will rise, will fall. Ice ages and glacial periods will continue to cycle. All human beings continue to be born and die, and it all begins again and again and again. So back to Mr. Hutton, I think he summarized it best. We find no vestige of a beginning, no prospect of an end. With that, I'll leave it to you, and um, I guess we'll turn it over to Boyd for some Q&A. Okay, well, thank you very much, Jeff. I really appreciate it. And um, I wanted to extend a, an apology to uh, those of you who um, uh, were initially rebuffed by the 100-person uh, limit. We fixed that, and I noticed that some of you came in afterwards, and I, I um, but I will say that we were um, recording this and give us a few days. We'll have it up on the library website under events and then recordings. And so you can uh, either uh, see the part you missed or review it, which I'm gonna do because I missed a lot of it. So anyway, um, I'll ask you if you could raise your virtual hands if you have a question. I'm sorry, I thought I had the chat box enabled, but I don't. So uh, if you want to raise your virtual hands and I'll recognize it uh, and then we'll unmute you. And I'm not seeing any. So are people able to do that? They should be. Um, maybe you want to explain it's in the reactions. Okay. Um, control at the bottom of your screen. Um, okay. It's a little so, smiley face. Um, Two people have raised their hand. Three. Andrea uh, is there, and I've asked her to unmute. She can't. I think you have to unmute her. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. And we can see you, Andrea. You can see me even. Okay. Um, so I live on the um, on North Beach Road near near the northern edge of uh, Orcas Island, um, and I've been across to Susha, and I've been really struck by how geologically different Susha seems um, from Orcas. And uh, I wonder if you could shed some light on that for me. Well, it's the same thing that uh, provides the complexity to the rest of the region. <clears throat> we were talking before everybody came on that the geology on San Juan is um, completely different than the geology on the Olympics, 27 miles away, 
completely different than the geology on the mainland in the Cascades, 25 miles away, and even completely different than um, um, Vancouver Island. So on a micro level, that applies to Susha, uh, Orcas, and Lopez and Shaw as well. Those were all different parts of those terrains that we showed earlier. Let's see if I can if I can get over to them. I'm not sure that I can I'll give it a try. Um, so the when the thrust faults arrived, when the terrains arrived, they um, the ones that found their way to the surface are what we see today as islands. And those islands, because they are each of them part of a different thrust fault or a different part of a different terrain, make up a different island. Here we see Spiden, here we see mm -hmm. John's, and we would see Spiden, uh, we would see other islands uh, up in the Charlottes as well. All these, as you will see, are the different parts of different terrains that stacked up as they arrived on the west coast. That's why the geology is different. It's because the rock was different. It was formed at different times, in different places, and it got picked up. So think of it this way, um, Andrea. If you have a bulldozer and you start it up on one end of San Juan and you drive in a straight line all the way to the north end of the island, when you get there, you have multiple stacks from different places on the island. And that's exactly what we have in these islands. All that material has been picked up by a giant bulldozer called subduction over 200 million years. And that bulldozer traveled from the middle of the South Pacific all the way to the islands. And the result is Biden and Lopez and Orcas and San Juan and all the others. And does that also account for the fabulous variety of pebbles that we have on our beaches? All those pebbles, yes, absolutely. So those pebbles come from all over the Puget Sound. They've been brought here from um, the Cascades by the glaciers. They've been brought here when um, uh, erosion hit the, the various terrains that arrived, eroded that rock, pulled it down into the Puget Sound, left it as sand, some of it as pebbles. Absolutely. That's why we have such, a, such a, an incredible variety of rocks on the beaches. Yes. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Andrea. Um, so Kathleen, I thought I saw your hand raised. Do you mind raising it again so I can unmute you? Okay, okay go for it. Well, it's a little embarrassing, but I'm laying in bed and I feel tremors and I look at the app for earthquake events and there's none. Am I just crazy? <laughs> I hope you're not ill. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've yeah. been in an earthquake. It feels the same to me, but then I don't know. That's odd. Okay. Well, I hope it's not. All right. That's why I lowered my hand. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. I got uh, Leah. <coughs> Hi, thanks. Um, not in the San Juans tonight, but this San Juans is my favorite place on earth. But my daughter and I were in Australia and uh, in the Red Center. And I think we learned that that had that same parallel fold. Um, uh, so Uluru, um, yeah. has the same anticline. Is that so? Is that that all across the globe we could find? instances absolutely. like this yeah absolutely the geology in uh, in australia and new zealand is absolutely fascinating that's some of the oldest rock on the planet uh, at least exposed rock um the rest of the the really old rock has either been uh, turned into new rock by melting or it's covered up by by something else but the some of the oldest exposed rock on the planet is in australia and what happens to rock over time it gets folded it gets collapsed it gets turned on its side so the next time you're you're any place on the planet and you see that you know this this synocline or anticline you'll know exactly what happened you have multiple layers of rock uh, that have accumulated over time, and then a fault of some kind has compressed it and pushed it either into an anticline 
or into a senocline. That's exactly what you're looking at. You're looking at the result of pressure on rock that was once horizontal um, and laid down that way. Awesome, thank you. Yep. Thank you, Leah. Um, are there other hands raised? Can you see me, uh, Lloyd? Well, go Is for it, Karen. Oh, okay. I heard um, in Lime Kiln uh, Park that there's some uh, pillow basalt, and I cannot find them. Yeah, it's right down on the shore, uh, as a matter of fact. Um, so, Do you have any pictures or locations? Eight. And tell people what pillow basalt is. Well, pillow basalt forms when um, lava has reached the surface and it finds a hole, and it's kind of like a bubble. So it bubbles out. But um, underwater, right? Uh, usually underwater, but not always. Um, but it bubbles up, and when it reaches the surface, it cools relatively quickly, and it retains that shape. So it's like little bubbles or like, um, i trying to think of another visual example. Um, kind of laid over each other like, uh, if somebody has a, gr a good metaphor for it, I can't think of one at the moment. But yes, it is down there. You will see pillow pill basalt right behind the, the lighthouse itself. And by the way, I, so I did a piece of study for a, a local person a couple of years ago uh, about that, um, uh, about Lime Kiln in particular. So if you drive around West Valley Road, behind Lime Kiln Park, you'll notice that big um, change in elevation, right from the road up to the top of um, the hill above Lime Kiln. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what that was is that's a deformation event. The, the, the water just off Lime Kiln is about 600 feet deep. So as that channel was being carved, it, it, under, it cut out the supporting structure from underneath Lime Kiln State Park. As it cut that uh, away, gravity began to grab Lime Kiln State Park and it pulled it downhill in one big event. So think of it as if you go down to South Beach today and you look at those um, where the sand has separated and slid down the side at Mount Finlayson, it's the exact same thing, but on a much larger scale. So you do see the pillow basalt there that is from uh, active uh, lava event. And also Lime Kiln is just a big deformation is there because it fell away from the, the higher part of the, the island there. Well, thank you very much. And yeah. boy, this has been wonderful. Thank you, good. Um, so I have Gail Miles, I have your hand raised and I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Great, can you hear me? Yes, hey, I can. Oh, well, I'm on Guaymas Island and I'm curious, where do our agates come from? Ooh, that's a good question. I don't, I don't have an answer for that one. I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty sure nobody brought them here, but um, I don't know. I, I'll tell you what. I, if if Boyd can give me your contact information, you pique my curiosity, and I'll find out and I'll tell you. Oh, that would be great. Yeah, right. I'm surprised I could stump you. Yeah. Well. Absolutely. Happy to help out. I mean, if anybody that knows me knows that I'm a little bit of a, a little bit of a fanatic when it comes to geology. So if I don't know something, I have to figure it out. And I don't know a lot, by the way. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, Gail. And now I yes. have uh, Sue Peterson. Hi, can you hey. hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello? Hi, we can hear you, Sue. Okay, um, so my question is, uh, as I go along in my boat from the Seattle area up into the San Juan Islands, I see, and I know this is more about, you're talking about the San Juans, but maybe you can answer the question. So I see places like Whidbey Island, which looks like it's comprised of mud, because it just slides and slides and slides. And then I get up into the San Juans and they're like rock. So, how is that? They're, they're so different, but again, they're really close together. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, if you own real estate on Whidbey and the next big one happens, um, um, bad news for your real estate. Whidbey, <laughs> Island, yeah. is a, Whidbey, Whidbey Island is a sandbar. It's, it's a Dunlin from the post-glacial oh period. So that is all sand. 
that accumulated. So if you go to the end of a river and you see the little rivulets running out through the sand, uh -huh. and you see like the, the little uh, islands of sand stranded out between the Dunlins, well, or between the little rivulets, that's what Whidbey Island is. It's a big pile of sand. So structurally, people that are building there are building on almost no rock at all. There is some, some bedrock here and there that, that runs fairly deep, but primarily Whidbey is, is a sandbar. Okay, thanks. That yep. answered my question. Okay, are there others who would like to raise, uh, raise their hand? I don't see any digital hands up, but um, is anybody trying to wave at me? Hello, thanks. I'm uh, not Amy. I'm Josh, um, but um, Amy is next to me. So we have uh, we live on Orcas Island, um, down on, on the water from the golf course. Um, we have a couple questions about some of the rocks there. So there's some uh, some rock that looks um, it's dark. It seems volcanic, like it's um, obsidian, but it's not quite obsidian. Uh, but but very dark uh, and, and seemingly volcanic. I'm just curious what kind of rock that is, and then I'm also holding uh, something that I'm curious about, which I don't know if you can see that. We have this type of rock on our property. You know, that's, that's sedimentary. And my guess is it's probably, I can't see it real well. That's definitely sediment. Is it real soft? No, it's hard and it's got these bubbles on it. Like Oh, you know what that may be? That might be um, limestone, but I'm not sure that I've ever seen that form. Um, it, uh, again, so Amy or Mr. Amy, if you could give um, Boyd your contact information, I'll get with you and, and I, I want to know what that yeah. is as well. My guess is the black stuff you're yeah. looking at is uh, maybe okay. basalt um, or mudstone, siltstone. Okay. If it's got um, white veins running through it, uh -huh. it's probably Orcas chert. Okay. Does it have white veins? No, it's um, no, no, it's it's real. It's real dark. I mean, it's very, I mean, it, it looks a lot like obsidian. It's just not quite that glassy, but it's very dark and, and uh, like that. If it's really glassy like that, kind of like soapy kind of feel to it. Yeah. Yeah, that's chert. That, that's okay. most likely chert. The Native Americans really like chert. They preferred obsidian, but obsidian's impossible to find here at all. Almost all of it came from Yellowstone and beyond, but they like chert because it's hard and they could flake it and make, um, you know, tools and arrowheads, etc. So my guess is it's probably chert. Okay. Yeah, with this one, we thought it might be bubble agate because it's got these layers here. I don't know, but but I'm not sure. Anyways, that may um, very well be. Yeah, okay. you, you stumped me on that one. Okay. Good. But I'm happy okay. to help. I would I would love to help. So that came from from Oregon. Yeah, yeah, we find this on our our beach. This is the largest one I have, but we find this just at, you know, on our beach pretty frequently. That's, that's yeah. really cool. Now I got I want to know. Yeah, me too. We'll follow up. <laughs> thanks. Yeah, Great. I'll try to connect you, Josh. All right, thanks. Uh, is there anybody else who's uh, wanting to ask a question? Again, I'm not seeing any hands, but if you if you can speak up or wave your hands or something. Okay, I'm not hearing anybody. So um, I'm going to go ahead and, and thank uh, Ranger Jeff for just a wonderful presentation. I really, really appreciate it. Um, I'd like to reiterate that this was recorded and we'll get this up on uh, up on the library site uh, pretty soon. And uh, and thank you all for participating. I really appreciate it. Thanks very much. Had a blast, and um, hopefully we'll be able to follow it up in the in the fall with another one. Thanks very much, Boyd, and thanks to uh, Floyd and the library as well. Great. Thank you. Thank thanks. You.